Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to call to order this regularly scheduled meeting of the Public Works and Infrastructure Committee for September 15th, 2022. I'm Andrew Johnson. I'm the chair of the committee. We have a full house today, which is great to see. Thank you for joining us for our committee's business today. And at this time, I will ask the clerk to call the roll so we can verify that we have a quorum of this committee. Councilmember Payne. Present. Wansley is absent. Vita. Present. Chugtai? Present. Vice Chair Koski? Present. Chair Johnson? Present. There are five members present. I'll let the record reflect that we have a quorum. I'll also note Councilmember Wansley is out sick, so we wish her uh, well in a quick uh, recovery. And with that, we have today's agenda before us. There are four items on the consent agenda that I will read for the record. The first is directing staff to complete a permanent solution for improving stormwater entering Lake Hiawatha through city-owned infrastructure in order to address litter and improve water quality and to report back by April 30th, 2023. The next item is authorizing the submittal of the City of Minneapolis and Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board's National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System Stormwater Management Program to the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency for review and approval. The next item is authorizing negotiation with private property owners to acquire easements as part of the 2024 street resurfacing program. And the next item is approving the establishment of the 2023 uniform assessment rates. We also have a walk on item that I'll add to the consent agenda is item number eight, and that is approving a large block event permit to allow the Mexican Independence Day block party to be held on September 18th, 2022 on Lake Street between 2nd Avenue South and Portland Avenue South. I will now see if there's any discussion on the consent agenda or if there are any items that anyone would like to pull for further discussion. I see Councilmember Payne. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I just um, was wondering maybe if this is directed for our Public Works Director. Uh, our assessments for the resurfacing program um, uh, and, uh, top of mind for me is the, our 29th Avenue resurfacing, and uh, just curious around um, once we do that resurfacing, what's the expected time before we would need to readdress that street's uh, maintenance? And I will turn to our public works director, Anderson Kelleher, uh, to either speak to this or introduce a staff member to respond. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Council Member Payne. I am looking for which, uh, which member of staff would like to take this, and I think I'm going to ask Mr. Masamoto to come to the microphone to hopefully help address this. Although I think your question is really about the maintenance cycle and when, after this resurfacing, when we will revisit any reconstruction or further resurfacing. So I'll just say that out loud before Mr. Masamoto starts. All right. Thank you, Director. Mr. Masamoto, welcome. Uh, good afternoon, uh, committee, committee chair. I apologize. I could not completely hear the question from Council Member Payne. Uh, uh, what would be that typical maintenance cycle of a resurfacing? Is it a 10-year, 15-year, 5-year? When would we have to revisit that, that road? Resurfacing um, Public Works has found is a very successful uh, method of managing our street infrastructure. And we have discovered since we started the program that we have extended the life of our streets much further than we originally thought of 10 years. And we're seeing comfortably 15 years of life extension. The next uh, logical step for us in our maintenance program would be to seal coat those streets, which are, is another program, which I'm not completely clear on where that is as I am not involved in the seal coating process, but that would typically be one of the tools in our toolbox to continue the extended life of our streets. And then may I ask a follow-up? Um, I, I believe we're also re redoing uh, the we're incorporating the ADA ramps within that resurfacing project. Uh, do we know um, 
if there would be a potential for any like curb bump outs through the ADA ramp or is, or is that a pretty standard ramp installation that doesn't really have a lot of flexibility? The uh, intent of the resurfacing is to follow the uh, federal guidelines, which is upgrading the corner ADA ramps along with our resurfacing. As far as any additional uh, possible enhancements, I will defer to someone else in the public works uh, department. Director. So, Mr. Chair and Councilmember Payne, I know this has been a great subject of conversation in the area around uh, 29th Street. And uh, in fact, I went and took a drive up there with our staff this week. And I think that in the resurfacing situation, we are really looking at staying within those curb lines with the upgrade of the ADA pedestrian ramps along the entire uh, section that will be redone. And we are also looking at if anything else can be added by the use of paint, uh, potentially being able to add some sort of uh, bike lanes in the area, looking at how wide that street is. I know that's not going to necessarily make everyone fully happy because at one time this was to be a reconstruction and I think that we're really looking at 10 to 15 years out before the street is reconstructed. When the team went out and did the soil sampling and the coring, the, the bed underneath the street is in uh, pretty good shape. And so usually we don't move to that street reconstruction phase until we have the underlying soils that need to come up and be replaced. Thank you. All right, thank you, Councilmember Payne. Any other comments or questions from colleagues? Not seeing any, I'll just add a quick comment on item number four, this staff direction. I just wanna extend my appreciation to Director Angie French and to Liz Stout for all of their work on this as well and their uh, continued advocacy and commitment to improving water quality. This is a, uh, once you start peeling back the layers of the onion, this becomes a very complex issue, a very difficult one to solve. And in this case, infrastructure that was put in place before any of us, uh, anyone in this room was working at the city, uh, yet it is our responsibility to uh, address concerns around infrastructure uh, that is uh, contributing to water quality impairment and adding litter. And so I know they continue to do a lot of work on this front. I'm really appreciative of all their work. So thank you very, very much. Uh, seeing no further questions or comments, I will ask the clerk to call the roll. Council Member Payne. Aye. Vita. Aye. Chuck Tai. Aye. Vice Chair Koski. Aye. Chair Johnson. Aye. There are five ayes. And that carries, those items are approved. And next we will move on to our first public hearing, which is considering an amendment to the 50th in France Special Service District Ordinance. So uh, on that public hearing, I will ask our director who will be presenting today. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. Andrew Carlson, project manager in transportation maintenance and repair will be doing this presentation. Perfect, thank you. Welcome, Mr. Carlson. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, hello, uh, Chair and Council members. My name is Andrew Carlson. I am the Project Manager for Special Service Districts. The 50th in France Special Service Districts uh, was established in uh, 2015 to better maintain the commercial area. In Special Service Districts, uh, property owners in the commercial area collectively impose service charges to fund enhanced services and district amenities. These are all over and above what the city normally provides. Typical, typical services include cleaning, greening, snow removal, and better maintenance of public spaces. Um, in addition, uh, public work staff engages with the advisory board to identify the desired services and develops an annual budget. Public works then implements those services in accordance um, with that plan. In this case, we have a, an enlargement to the 50th in France Special Service District. Uh, the property owner uh, of this property located at 4901 through 4921 France Avenue South has petitioned the city to have their properties added to the district. Uh, other property owners um, will not be affected by this. The advisory board uh, supports the enlarging of the district to include the properties described. Uh, 
District services will commence upon construction completion and service charges will be imposed starting with the 2024 uh, property tax year. Amending the boundary description within the district's current ordinance is the official act by which a district is enlarged. An ordinance amendment to enlarge the 50th and France Special Service District was introduced at the August 18th City Council meeting uh, for its first reading and referred to the Public Works and Infrastructure Committee in accordance with Minnesota Statute 428A.04. Notices of this public hearing have been published in the official newspaper. Notices have also been sent to the affected property owner and other ratepayers within the district. Uh, the city attorney's office has certified that the petition requirements of Minnesota Statute 428A.04 have been met. Staff therefore recommends that the city council amend the Minneapolis Code of Ordinances, Chapter 428A, to enlarge the 50th and France Special Service Districts. So a lot of words for um, a small addition uh, to an existing district. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. Carlson. And uh, before I go on, uh, and I know we have a question here, I'll quick mention as well, I got a, a little note here. Director Kraft, I'm so sorry if I called you Angie French. Uh, you, you can tell that I was up late last night uh, because of my baby who's sick and did not get enough caffeine. And that's somebody else who I invited to a meeting. So Director Kraft, my apologies, but thank you so much for all of your work. So. We will uh, continue on. I know we have a comment or question, I think, from Councilmember Chuck Tai. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm wondering if you can just quick speak to why there's such a small in enlargement here instead, you know, it's not going all the way back to Beard or just explain why it's this tiny little section. Uh, uh Councilmember Chuck Tai, uh, Chair Johnson, Council Members. So this is uh, based specifically on uh, the request on the part of that particular property owner. So this site's being redeveloped, and uh, their request is to have the uh, district enlarged to include them so that services can be provided for in front of them. Um, I think more generally speaking, yes, it would be the purview of, of the council to expand a district, to incorporate additional uh, Areas, uh, we do see that from time to time, uh, but this particular one is just at the request of a particular property owner. Wonderful, thank you. Excellent, thank you. Uh, not seeing any further questions on that, while well, I will ask, uh, I, I'm going to proceed to open the public hearing and then ask our clerk if anyone signed up to speak. Not seeing any, so I'll say, uh, anyone here signed up to speak on this, or anyone wanting to speak on this, going once? Going twice, sold, I'm gonna go ahead and close the public hearing and uh, go ahead and move approval of this item and I will see if there is any uh, additional discussion or comments or questions on this. Not seeing any, uh, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, say nay. The ayes have it and the committee's recommendation will be forwarded to next week's council meeting for final action. Now moving on to item number uh, two of the public hearings. It is the consideration of the 2023 proposed services and service charges for the downtown business improvement special service district, uh, which we call DID. And I will turn it over to our director to introduce the staff who will present today. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. Today, our deputy director, Brett Jelly, will be making this presentation. Excellent. Welcome, Mr. Jelly. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair and committee members. My name is Brett Jelly, and I'm a deputy director in Public Works. I am in front of you this afternoon to introduce the public hearing on the 2023 operating plan and service charges for the Downtown Business Improvement Special Service District, which is also known as the DID. This is an annual hearing that is required as part of the City Council's review and approval of the district's proposed services and service charges for next year. The DID was established by Minneapolis Code of Ordinances in December of 2008 and began full service operations in July of 2009. The district has been renewed in 2013, 2017, and most recently in 2021. Each year, the DID's board, made up of downtown property owners, employers, and residents establishes a budget for accomplishing their goals of making downtown Minneapolis clean, green, safe, and vibrant. Public hearing notices and the proposed operating plan were mailed to all ratepayers 
The DID hosted an open house on September 6th. This open house was advertised in a number of locations, including all hearing notices in the DID office and on the DID website. The proposed 2023 service charges are $8,126,886. I will note, uh, in addition to any testimony today, uh, 11 letters of support were sent to the city clerk and should be available for your review. And with that, I would like to introduce Steve Kramer, who's the president and CEO of the Minneapolis Downtown Council and the Minneapolis Downtown Improvement District to get some highlights of the 2023 operating plan. Excellent. Welcome, Mr. Kramer. Thank you, Mr. Chair, committee members. Brett, I appreciate this opportunity every year to talk a little bit about what's going on at the DID. This is, uh, if you help me with the, uh, there we go. Great. Thank you, Brett. So this is our mission statement, as you can see. <clears throat> and as Brett suggested, we pr uh, provide services that support, preserve, create, and enhance a vibrant, competitive, thriving downtown to attract and retain businesses, employer, employees, residents, and visitors. And you can see the geography of the DID. We kind of describe it as the front door of Target Field to the front door of U.S. Bank Stadium, Convention Center, almost to the riverfront. And in that area, 120 blocks roughly, 900 properties, uh, 250 unique commercial owners that contribute through service charges, we'll describe here in a second, to the DID. Uh, Brett noted, formed in 20, started operations in 2009, organized as a 501c6 nonprofit under the terms of state law and the city ordinance. So how do we how do we come up with that 8.1 million dollars or so? Uh, can we assess service charge in in two different parts of that overall district? So you can see the peach color is the primary service area for DID, and the blue is the secondary area. And that peach area, 100% of the charges uh, created through the formula that I'll describe here in a second are, are charged, and then in the blue area, 50%. And those charges are determined by for those 200, uh, 900 uh, commercial properties, the linear square footage of the property, so how much street frontage there is, and then the gross building area or the density of the building. And those help us determine what the charge is. Again, 100% in the peach area, 50% in the, in the blue area for the services that we'll talk about here in a second. Those activities fall into these main categories, and we won't talk about all of them, but we'll talk about a few of them. Certainly our ambassador livability and safety and communications program, public safety, community outreach partnership, social impact, placemaking, activation, community engagement, very important, maintenance and repair of, of enhanced streetscapes, and then greening and public realm improvements. And without a doubt, our most visible and popular program is the ambassador program, and I'm gonna invite the general manager of uh, the block by block organization that we contract with to provide the ambassador program, Lavelle Wakefield, to talk a little bit about, about the ambassadors. All right, welcome. Thank you so much. Um, first time in front of the city council, so excuse me if I'm a little nervous, but um, like Mr. Kramer said, we are the contract provider for um, the DID, we were our block by block, um, and we do provide all of the hospitality, cleaning, safety, and outreach services to the downtown council. Um, with that being said, um, our hospitality program is, you know, bar none, it's one of those services that is probably the most visible that you will see throughout um, the downtown area. It is where the businesses get the bang for the buck. This is where we are here to really showcase our city and what we have to offer. Um, our cleaners, of course, are the you know bread and butter. They are out there making sure that the city is clean, making sure that the city is presentable, making sure that we are able to have that um, have those um, things clean for the for the city. Um, we also have an overnight crew um, that does power washing. They go through and do block faces throughout the city, um, making sure that the sidewalks are clean and debris free. Um, with that, we also operate a street sweeper that goes around downtown. So if you're ever out pretty late at night, you'll see the street sweepers and the power washers out there um, busting through that grime there. Um, our livability program does outreach services to the at-risk communities in downtown Minneapolis. They also serve as a, um, 
uh, intermediary and intervener in situations and being able to kind of de-escalate some of those situations as well. And as you can see on this slide here, um, we have a total of 79 employees. Um, 59 of them are Minneapolis residents and more than 37 have been employed with Block by Block for four or more years. Um, and these statistics here are some of the just the data collection points that we've gathered over the years. Um, 388,000 bags of trash have been removed from the city and we do that um, not lightly. It is not clean work. It is very dirty work. It is the, it is the, the bane sometimes just to get that, that garbage and pull it out and get it on you. You know, I've went through that. I've been out there. I've pulled those garbage bags. And just to, to see this number always just kind of brings a little light to my eyes just to know that, like, we're able to track this and kind of really get this, um, get these things off of the street. And with that, I'm going to pass it back over to Steve. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Lil. So these days, without a doubt, uh, safety is the number one issue for all of us, right? No, no question about that. That's certainly true downtown as well. And DID has always been very focused on that issue. And as you can see, of the budget, over $3 million is allocated towards a variety of safety strategies. And I, I'm, I'm proud that over the years, DID really has developed a comprehensive approach to safety, certainly working very closely with our law enforcement partners. And you'll hear from Inspector Peterson, the first precinct commander, as well as other law enforcement agencies, but also a wide variety of community partners. And let me just, I, I like this, let me go back one. I like this display because it shows that kind of comprehensive approach. And there, and there, there may be some familiar, familiar faces in the audience because we have James, our social worker, partnership with Hennepin County, and a couple of our ambassadors, uh, SE and uh, Alfonso, thank you. And then you lead us, one of our livability workers. He just does fantastic work. And uh, uh, other community partners as well, Mad Dads, 21 Days of Peace. We have a strong communication link out of the first precinct to the Safety Communication Center that helps integrate communications between private security, public, public law enforcement, these community groups. So it really is, has evolved over the years since 2009 into this very comprehensive safety approach. These days, with the preoccupation that certainly we have, and I, I know you all support, of kind of reactivating the downtown economy, a big part of that is getting office workers back. And so we've, there's been a high demand for safety workshops. Shane's on our safety director, Renee Allen, the community uh, crime prevention specialist from the first precinct, have done dozens and dozens of these discussions with, with downtown workers to help kind of build confidence about what the reality of safety is versus sometimes what the kind of larger perception that's not necessarily grounded in reality is, and so that's been very, very important for us to do, especially these days. And I also wanted to highlight kind of a community storage program that is very much a partnership with the city. It's located in Ramp B, so we work with Public Works, with, with MnDOT, uh, and that offers an opportunity for folks to, uh, who are on the streets to have a, a safe place where they can store their belongings, mm -hmm. which is just you know really important in terms of their ability to apply for a job or go look for housing or any number of things that are much more easier to do without literally dragging your life and your belongings along. I happened to be with some folks from Street Voices of Change earlier today and they said this program is full, we need to expand it and we're actually working now with you all to try to expand this program. So just again an example of sort of the breadth of safety related activities that DID has, has engaged in over the years. The companion to safety in terms of getting the downtown economy back uh, uh, alive is, is activation and vibrancy. And that's another strong focus area. We have a, a storefront office in the 600 block of Nicollet and the Gavade Common uh, uh, Project. And it's a very active place. You can see the chess uh, board out front. There's always an active chess game going on. Uh, we have a partnership with the Sunshine Shop where people can come and actually get clothing for free occasionally on our first Tuesday socials. We have a street, uh, street uh, show performance where there are curated street performers up and down Nicollet and other parts of downtown. So uh, that's part of the activation program. Farmer's Market was back this year on Thursdays. Every third Thursday, we kind of made a special effort at the corner of 8th and Nicollet to enhance that with our Downtown Thursdays program. And you can see some of the activation that uh, occurred there. 
Nicollet Street Eats program in the, uh, in the uh, uh, bottom corner there is a partnership with NEON, uh, Northside Economic Opportunity Network, and uh, those are the best, uh, 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 best food around uh, for downtown this past summer. And then finally in August, we had our annual street art festival, which was a great two-day event over a weekend, and some of that art was actually out for several weeks until it started to rain and it got washed away. And then last thing I'll highlight before talking briefly about the budget, we also have maintenance responsibilities, especially for Nicollet. And now that Hennepin is almost done, I just got an email today that the bus shelters on, Nicollet, on Hennepin are going in and no, October and November, and some of the buses that got shifted from Hennepin and Nicollet are going back to Hennepin in December. So that will be, that will be great. Uh, Nicollet is primarily a re responsibility of DID to, to, to maintain and operate, and, and, and we have enhanced responsibilities on Hennepin as well, especially for these beautiful flower gardens that you can, you can see depicted there in the lower right-hand corner. And then finally, as Brett said, our overall budget is a little over $8.1 million. That does represent a pretty big increase compared to past increases, an 8.45% uh, uh, year-over-year increase. Our Budget and Operations Committee was unanimously in support of that. It reflects both the reality that the Ambassador Program, which is our main, our main expense, is increasing in cost. We have also have a little more capacity in that program to do some new things starting next year perhaps be more visible in the skyways, perhaps be able to you know, respond to specific needs in the city. We often work with Meet Minneapolis to help uh, conventions that are in town that want that additional presence for their convention visitors. And it also reflects the fact that we are now responsible for some of the maintenance on Hennepin Avenue. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any, but I also know there's some folks here to testify. Great, thank you so much, Mr. Kramer. I will see if there are any questions from committee members first. And, but, and reminder to committee members as well, we are gonna open the public uh, hearing and have that as well. So maybe just questions at this time rather than comments, but Councilmember Payne. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I was just curious, uh, looking at the three sources of revenue, um, the linear foot, the gross um, square footage, and then this opt-in, uh, Aside from the opt-in, is it all assessed similarly? And then are there any restrictions to those funds? The, the formula, the gross linear square foot and gross building area applies equally to all of the commercial properties. Again, with a caveat, council member, that there's the 100% rate and the 50% rate based on that map that I, that I showed. Uh, the opt-ins are, are quite variable from the city opting in as though they were being assessed, which was part of the original setup of DID in 2009 to other organizations that are exempt from special services districts but wanting to participate based on just some kind of negotiated payment. So it's quite, quite variable in that respect. In terms of restrictions on the use of the, the funds, uh, you know, we're governed by state law and city ordinance, so any restrictions would be embedded there. They're all pretty basic things that you can see that are kind of supplemental of city services, so we don't uh, supplant so city services, but we supplement those in these areas of cleaning, greening, vibrancy, and safety. And then I was curious around the um, geographic boundaries. I know that, for instance, North Loop has become a much more vibrant part of downtown, but it's technically not within that district. What, what does it look like to reflect you know, our growing downtown footprint? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And we've actually had conversations with, with, with North Loop about whether if not an expansion of DID, a separate special services district there might make sense. I think the challenge for, for North Loop and other parts of the riverfront that are not in the current boundary is that under state law, residential property is exempt from a special services district. So a part of downtown that is predominantly or at least largely residential, it just becomes more challenging to kind of make the economics work for the remaining commercial owners. Uh, but I think those discussions will will continue off and on, and uh, there's actually probably going to be a, a dialogue at the state at the state legislature at some point, not driven by us, but driven by some other cities that have DID like operations about whether that might might change or maybe there'd be a local option for a city to include residential property. But right now it's excluded, and so that's kind of the limiter in terms of North Loop or the or the Mill District. Uh, and then final question, uh, we just talked about the special service district over at 50th and right. France. There's a number of these districts across the city. Um, 
the downtown, uh, the safety ambassador program is popular downtown. You know, my, my head goes to, can we have this in other places? Yeah. But my understanding is that these are unique organizations that aren't necessarily a part of each other and sharing resources in that way. What, from your perspective, would be required to be able yeah. to stand up that type of safety ambassador program in other parts of the city? Sure. Well, Mr. Carlson would be the expert on many of those other uh, uh, districts that are managed by the city DID is large enough to be a self-managed uh, district and so I think there's both that governance distinction and maybe more importantly I mean, we have the great benefit of being able to draw on this incredible commercial property tax base and, and downtown to generate this now eight million dollar plus budget that allows us to invest in the kinds of programs including the ambassadors you know, some of the commercial districts it would be challenge financially, I think, to be able to stand up the program. Our view always has been, when asked, we were delighted to work in, on a technical assistance basis with any area that might want to try to, to do that, if not based on service charges or assessments, perhaps phil philanthropy someplace. So that is an open offer to any part of the city that to the extent that we could help plan something like that, if the finances could be figured out, we're there to help. And then final, final question. Um, 2020, 2021, all the headlines were the death of downtowns across the country. And I think that we've seen that to not necessarily be the case, but there are these macro trends of folks working in more hybrid or remote configurations. How are we thinking about um, the role of downtown as some of these kind of, I don't want to say post COVID, but yeah permanent COVID future. Um, how, how are we thinking differently about the role of DID and how it can support our downtown district? It's a great, great question. And we just, we just finished the DID strategic plan that kind of asked ourselves that very question. And on the downtown council side of our organization, we're about to enter into a planning process next year to also ask that, that question. I mean, the, the way I think about it, uh, Mr. Chairman, Councilmember Payne, and others, is you know there are a number of, of streams that feed the downtown economy. Certainly, the office population is one of those, and that's the one that probably is going to be most different going forward for the very reasons that you you mentioned. We also have events, and and uh, those are going well, and and conventions are beginning to come back. So you know those the streams are at various points in the recovery curve. Um, I, I do think that our downtown is going to change in terms of not, it's going to continue to be a center of commerce and a center for major employers. We haven't seen a major exodus of companies, and I don't expect that. Uh, but we won't see as many office workers in that daytime office, uh, you know, uh, nine to five period as we have in the past. That'll have implications for you know, some of the restaurants, some of the retailers, especially at the Skyway level. And so we'll have to go through a period of kind of recognizing the need for some reinvention in in those areas and you know, we're kind of beginning to, to to look at what that might mean thank you all right thank you councilmember Payne. councilmember no all right well that wraps thank up very much for the time. questions thank you mr kramer so uh thank you for the presentation i'm going to go ahead and open the public hearing i have a list of those who've signed up to speak today and i'll call uh, your name's in order, and if you did not sign up to speak and wish to speak, please see the clerk to do so. Normally, we would have uh, like a, sh a shot clock out here for two minutes or so. We don't have that today, and that's fine. Uh, but just maybe for folks, if you can kind of stick around that two-minute mark, that would be appreciated, uh, because I know we do have another public hearing after this. So the first name is Grace. Please come on up, Grace, and then we'll have Bill after Grace. Welcome. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Grace Waltz, and I'm the Vice President of Public Policy at the Minneapolis Regional Chamber, also a Minneapolis resident. I'm here today to speak in support of our partners and downtown office neighbors, uh, the Minneapolis Downtown Improvement District, and their 2023 operating plan and budget. For the last 13 years, DID has been committed to creating a better downtown for employers, residents, and visitors. This has taken on a renewed importance as we continue to welcome office workers back downtown we know we can rely on DID to keep the area clean and be a welcoming face. They're also a highly visible resource for anyone who has questions as they are navigating downtown. This is particularly important for our small businesses that really need those workers, visitors, and residents to shop, eat, and experience downtown. Personally, it was always the highlight of my work weeks in the summer to visit the downtown farmer's market. 
And as Steve mentioned, we're also grateful for their work in putting on the Downtown Street Art Festival last month. Finally, DID's ability to be nimble and adapt to the changing needs of downtown and serve as a resource for properties and businesses, while also having the ability to address problems with an operational response is something we can all feel proud of. We wholeheartedly endorse the DID and urge you to approve their 2023 budget as presented. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Grace. Next up, we have Bill Peterson, who is our inspector for the first precinct. Welcome. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. And Committee members, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to come here this afternoon to speak on behalf of the DID. Um, I've been downtown now, assigned in different capacities for just over uh, five years. I spent a couple years as the day watch lieutenant, and I've been the inspector for um, three years now. Um, before I came downtown, I didn't know a whole lot about DID, and I quickly learned what a um, phenomenal public safety partner they are. I know that Steve Kramer did an amazing job covering a lot of the uh, things that they offer. Um, as our numbers have dwindled um, over the past couple of years, I've found them to be a um, phenomenal complement um, for our public safety needs. Uh, he touched on the DID ambassadors. I can tell you they're a welcome site for me as I travel throughout downtown. The job that they do um, keeping downtown clean is absolutely amazing. Um, I've often called on them to clean up things like graffiti and and um, most recently trimming up some shrubbery that was um, causing us some issues. Um, you know, being able to work through them with the Safety Communication Center, their ability to connect with um, a large number of businesses in downtown through Radio Link. Uh, the DID livability team does an out, outstanding job as well. Um, I can't say enough for James Seals, the uh, social worker, uh, the work that he does. Uh, he's often in our meetings and really helping us hone in on those people that really do need um, that sort of outreach downtown, but also D DID has done uh, an excellent job um, with a kind of a, a really a holistic approach, uh, putting outreach out in areas where we need them most, working very closely with Mad Dads, uh, 21 Days of Peace out there to complement um, the finite number of resources that I have to put out there on the street. Um, I touched on the, uh, or actually Steve touched on the safety workshops that um, both my crime prevention specialist, Renee Allen, and um, Shane Zondu. I know that you know downtown businesses, community members are very, very appreciative of those. They talked about the activation, something that I think is vital to bringing back um, downtown and, and the safety of downtown. Um, I don't think anybody touched on the Aquatennial Parade and fireworks, both very, very large, fun, festive, safe uh, events that we work very, very closely with them on, and I could go on and on about um, how much I think of DID and the work that they do, but I'm very grateful and thankful for DID's support. Um, I think they're an excellent public safety uh, partner, and uh, they have my full support. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much, Inspector. Next, we have David, followed by Anna. Welcome. Good afternoon, Chair and committee members. My name is David Saylor Halgren. I'm the VP of Marketing and Guest Relations for the Minnesota Orchestra. And we want to express our strong support of the DID and specifically the approval of this operating plan and budget. The Minnesota Orchestra is Minnesota's largest performing arts organization, and it makes it ho its home at Orchestra Hall on the south side of Nicollet Mall. We're a proud partner of the downtown community and this promise of partnership is evident in the key objective of our, of our own strategic plan, which is to lift up Minneapolis. At a time when there's often a spotlight on issues facing downtown, the DID is a critical and adaptable component in creating a better, more welcoming environment for our employees, our neighbors, visitors to our restaurants, merchants, and cultural amenities. <clears throat> the Minnesota Orchestra is proud to be a part of our downtown community that supports its businesses and nonprofits with this invaluable resource. This past year, over 200,000 guests have attended performances, community and corporate events at Orchestra Hall on a weekly basis. They enjoyed activities at Orchestra Hall safely and without incident, and we attributed some of this success, this success to the collaborative partners at the DID. Having the DID team's friendly, collegiate Collegial presence has made us feel confident, providing the community with events in a time when many others have retracted from their offerings. Just outside our front door at Orchestralis PV Plaza, a beautiful refurbished anchor of the Nicollet Mall. This is a vital space for the city and the orchestra, and it helps to build the confidence in our downtown as an attractive place to live and work. 
and the DID presence is essential in this effort. The DID staff have been great partners responding quickly to our requests and inquiries and serving as great connectors for us. Our staff has relied on the DID ambassadors and, their, and other partners like Mad Dads and the Livability team throughout our entire season. In July, when the orchestra offered its International Day of Music on PV Plaza for the first time since the pandemic began, the DID was an extraordinary partner in helping thousands of audience members feel welcome and safe downtown. The orchestra has always appreciated the important work of the DID in making our downtown cleaner, safer, greener, and friendlier, and never so much have we appreciated than in recent years. The DID model represents the best of what can happen when our core downtown community works together, and as such, the Minnesota Orchestra enthusiastically endorses the DID and urges you to approve this budget. Thank you. All right, thank you, David. We have Anna up next, followed by Alitas. Good morning, or good afternoon. I'm Anna Koskren. I'm a Minneapolis resident and also um, a partner at a commercial real estate firm, NTH. We're here downtown, and we help organizations make decisions about their space. And I'm going to keep my comments pretty short because these guys are hard to follow. They've covered a lot of why the idea is so special. But I'm talking with a lot of people about well, what do we want to do with our office space? Is downtown still a place to be? Should we be here? And we often point to the work of DID and the downtown council. And seeing the folks in the, the ambassadors, the livability team, that really helps build people's confidence. Things are changing. They're not going to be the same they were in 2019. But DID is critical to helping people get re-energized about being downtown, participating downtown, and the health of downtown supports the health of our entire city, which supports the health of the entire region. So I want to enthusiastically say I add my support and all the other great things everyone else has shared about this great partnership that DID created to support the community. Excellent. Thank you, Anna. And Alitas, welcome. Oh, it's good to be here. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> it's an honor to be here. It's also an honor to be on the streets, providing the service for the unhoused such as making EMS calls, getting housing, getting shelter, the Salvation Army. Uh, we work with the Adult Shelter Connect at St. Olaf's Church. Um, <clears throat> bringing food and water is really important. Uh, and we know we get into the different seasons, you know, blankets, hand warmers, gloves, whatever we can do to provide a service. We can't be just check the box without helping people. And it's an honor to be here and, um, you know, hearing the people's stories on the streets, um, putting yourself where they're at, meeting them where they're at. And they just need somebody just to believe in them. And that's where we're all here today. And I just want to thank you just for, you know, allowing us to be here and doing what we do. That's what we do, right? <laughs> man, yes, sir. Got to go out there and get it in, man, you know? <laughs> Uh, and I'd like to say, uh, before I get off this, it's, uh, you know, uh, not having a knot in your stomach and, you know, getting up here and, you know, uh, having a gift to do what we do. And most importantly, uh, we teach our clients on the streets to walk through life and not get dragged through life. Mm -hmm. And that's what DID is trying to do. Thank you so much for your time. That's it, man. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, and thank you for all of your work. Uh, I want to see if anyone else is here to speak who has not signed up. If so, please feel free to come up. Welcome. Yes, please come on up. And then uh, afterwards, after you're done speaking, if uh, you could please just see our clerk to make sure that our clerks get your information. Welcome. Please. Hi. My name is Darlene Compare. Um, I was in a homeless shelter program at the uh, Salvation Army where I was put at the Millennium Hotel. Um, I was drugged and raped at the Millennium Hotel. Um, I have evidence of everything I'm saying. I done made plenty of police reports. Um, I mean, I literally came down here, har harassed them for the past two years. I know who my rapists are. You know, like, I moved to Eden Valley. You know, I got my Section 8 through Stern County, not through Hennepin County. Um, the Hennepin County staff didn't help us. You know, they treat us like shit. You know, if you wasn't doing favor for them or something else, you was not, you know, first in line. Nobody know what we went through unless we are here to tell you what went on through the program. 
So I'm here trying to get some type of justice for myself because like I said, I know who my rapists are. Um, when I try to tell everybody my story and it's like, oh, they, they're trying to make it seem like I have some type of mental health issue or, you know, I'm a drug addict. I'm just a homeless woman, you know, that nobody care about. But I'm not going to stop until something's done about the situation. And from my understanding, a young lady was raped and killed recently, you know, but you don't see nobody talking about that. You don't see nobody trying to, you know, get to the bottom of this. So how, how are we going to handle the situation? Because us homeless people can't just come in here like I just did and tell my story. Nobody want to help us. You know, if we come in here looking like trash, nobody's going to, you know, they're not going to believe our story. But it's been two years since that happened to me. And I'm still dealing with the situation. And I need help with the situation. The Minneapolis Police Department is not helping me. So what do I do? What are we well, going to do about this? For us homeless people that is out there in the street that don't have nobody. Yeah, I, I first off, I want to say I'm I'm very sorry, and that this has been your experience. I thank you for coming forward. Uh, we do have, for instance, a leader from the Minneapolis Police Department right here in the room, and I'm happy to connect with you after this as well. I this is a to Detective Emily Olson, yeah. and she basically told me that I needed to see some type of mental health evaluation. Well, I am happy to connect up with <laughs> so, you after this meeting and figure out a path forward for you. Uh, yeah, we do have because I want for, something done. Yeah, you know, and, I recorded this. I recorded yeah. my rape. I know who my rapists are. You know, staffs at the um, Millennium knew about it for Hennepin County. That was doing internship through a church. From my understanding, they used to be drug addicts too, and they went to this program where they're able to work for the you know for the city, mm. for the county. So. so so I am happy to connect up with you afterwards. I know yeah. we have others in the room as well um, that are happy to be a part of that. For this specific item before us, this is a public hearing on this uh, renewal of this special service district. And mm -hmm. so we are by law required to keep comments limited to that specifically. But I will absolutely connect up with you afterwards. And we got folks here in the room too. Uh, Inspector, I, I see a nod on your head. Maybe you'd be willing to stick around afterwards as well uh, and connect up and figure out next steps. Thank for you. you. So, thank you. Is there anyone else here to speak specifically on the downtown improvement district in this item before us who hasn't signed up? Anyone else? All right. Not seeing anyone else. I'm going to go ahead and close this public hearing and I will see if there are any comments or questions from my colleagues. Councilmember Vita. Thank you, Chair Johnson. I just want to say thank you all so much for this presentation. And it's so cool to see the familiar faces from the, the DID. Um, Ulitis and I met while he was working downtown. Um, it was a, a really good experience. I, I was out with EMS on a ride along and uh, ran, to, ran into him on the site of um, a critical incident. And, he was doing exactly what has been described in this public hearing today, the services they provide uh, for DID. And so thank you. I also see a lot of the entertainment team from the DID um, sitting in the back. I try my best every chance I could to get out to downtown Thursdays, downtown Tuesday, whatever day. I try my best to get out there and support all of the wonderful entertainment. Uh, Council Member Rainville and I put it on our calendars to get out and walk around and we love greeting the DID staff. Uh, they, I have never seen people more passionate about picking up trash in my life. They love their jobs, they're happy to talk. It's, they're just beautiful stories when you talk to who is working, who's a part of that DID team. These are our neighbors, this is our community that is uh, finding so much joy in being a part of uh, what's happening in downtown Minneapolis. So I, I mean, you all know that I support the work that you're doing. And then finally, I just wanna shout out the two Catherines that watch the camera over at the first precinct for the DID. One goes by Catherine, the other by Cat, but they're both named Catherine. I've been over with them a couple times to watch 
the cameras to see. They've shown me the steps of City Hall from the cameras. You know, they keep their eye on the streets. They, they're so passionate because we have so few officers. They're making sure that they're committed to like literally seeing what's happening on the streets in real time so that folks downtown can feel safe. And so again, I just wanna thank you all. I couldn't um, thank you enough for the services you provide in downtown Minneapolis and um, really committed to making sure when folks come to visit or people who live here have a safe, clean, welcome, warm experience in, in the heart of our city. So thank you all so very much. Very well said, Councilmember Vita. Any other comments or questions, Councilmember Chugtai? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I've got just a few questions. I think this first one uh, might be for some combination of Director Anderson Kelleher and then Mr. Wilcox and Ms. Bremer um, from the City Attorney's Office. Um, just from my very brief conversation with the director, my understanding is our responsibility in in this part of the equation. Um, is it, like approving this this plan that's presented to us and, and approving this budget that um, that um, Mr. Kramer and his team have have presented. Um, can you just can staff just clarify what the why we are why this is our why this is something that we're doing and then um, if we have a role in the approval of the budget then you know are the if, are there chain things that we can change with what's presented to us, or is this mostly, um, you know, like a ceremonial thing? Thank you, Councilmember Chugtai. I think I'll uh, look first to our city attorney's staff on that, and then also note that Mr. Jelly's available as well. Sure. Uh, thank you, Chair Johnson, Councilmember Chugtai. Uh, that's a great question. So, under our our enacting ordinance, uh, which is uh, chapter 465 of the Minneapolis Code, uh, 465.20, it talks about the special services to be performed, operating plans and service agreements. There's a provision uh, in there uh, that, as you mentioned, does require um, the City Council to review and approve by resolution the operating plan. Um, however, there is also a, a provision in the code that states the special services described in the plan will be furnished by the Downtown Council. So the Downtown Council does propose uh, the service plan, and, and, and that's why they presented it here. Uh, you know, to your question as to whether or not this is simply ceremonial, you know, no, obviously you as the council, you retain that authority, uh, you know, to, to approve your resolution. However, I would suggest and caution that it isn't a process whereby uh, there'd be like a line item veto and an insertion or a change. I think the, the proper process, if, if you didn't feel that this operating plan would be appropriate, would be for you to uh, have discussions um, with the downtown council, uh, explain your concerns, and then they would, you know, inform them of a operating budget or a plan that you would be supportive of, which they could bring back forward. Uh, the reason you can't simply, you know, engage in like a line item uh, process here is because these notices have to go out. Uh, that would completely change uh, the calculation of the service assessment of the charges to the ratepayers. Notices have to go out. The individuals have to have an opportunity for a public hearing. So that's why that process, it's not as simple as us changing it on the fly. Um, does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. Um, that, that's really, really helpful. You know, I think five, uh, four out of the five of us um, that are here today and then five out of the six members of this committee, um, we're, this are, we're brand new. It's our first time here and this is our first time going through this. And so I think I, um, having seen the letters of support come through my inbox over these last few days and then going through um, this presentation today, um, all very helpful. But, uh, you know, I think when we, when we, when, when we're talking about our role here being the approval of an operating plan, the approval of, of the way that you're spending your budget, it'd be really nice in the future, I think, um, just to have you reach out beforehand and, and tell us what you're going to present to us, uh, you know, prior to, um, prior to this type of more formal presentation and, and give us the opportunity um, to ask you more specific questions about your operating plan, the budget, um, and and give that type of feedback. You know, we're sitting here, um, and it's it's clearly too late for for these types of changes to be made. And um, and I, I would just really appreciate that being different moving forward. Um, 
But uh, that being said, I actually do have a question just going back to, and I think this might be a more appropriate question either for Mr. Kramer or from um, the gentleman who presented to us uh, from the ambassador program, but uh, just looking through the 79 employees, um, 66 of those being um, union members. I, I used to work at SEIU. Uh, Local 26 represents, I believe, these these um, these workers. And just wondering what the if you can explain a little bit more about that discrepancy of the 66 out of 79 being union members, and what about the rest of those folks? And it also looks like our director may have a comment or a question. Or so, Mr. Chair, and sorry, uh, Councilmember Chuck Tai, before that question, it, there was a part of your question you asked that I think is important. There's actually a volunteer board that is appointed that oversees the budgetary recommendations here that, um, you know, has sort of a step between what the, the management of the DID would submit and then a conversation around what is needed. And so it essentially there is a step between here that we maybe, it was probably very quickly talked about uh, when Mr. Carlson was up, and it's an important part of the process because those volunteers are looking over that budget and maybe Mr. Kramer could address that volunteer board as he addresses your other question as well. I think it's an important uh, oversight step as well. Yeah, Mr. thank Chairman, you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, Chairman uh, Councilmember Chuck Tai. Just on that on that point, uh, we do have a budget and operations committee that's created in our organizational bylaws. It's drawn from a cross section of the ratepayers, and they really do work with us to fashion this service plan and budget that comes forward in this way to the city council. I'd also note that we have a quarterly meeting with city staff, public works, city finance, city attorney's office to go over contracts to go over issues around the partnership that we have with all the city departments, public works, CPED, police, et cetera. So there's a lot of engagement on an ongoing basis in terms of oversight of the city with this work. In terms of your question about uh, uh, the union membership versus non, I think that's largely because there's a, obviously a, man, a management staff as well that would be outside the membership of the, of the SEIU local, but I would ask Lavelle maybe to comment on that. So within that number, that does, like Mr. Kramer said, include the management team and then some of the more um, specialty um, services that we provide as well that just don't qualify to be part of that union. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Kramer, I'm, I'm really glad to hear that you're meeting very, you know, once a quarter with the city and, and there's, there's further communication um, just from having attended a couple of meetings of the special service districts in, in my ward. I know Mr. Carlson and his team are very regular um, uh, they, they attend these meetings very regularly and, and are active participants in them. Um, I would imagine it's no different for you than it is for other special service districts. But, um, I think my, my comment about that, the, the budgetary piece and the operating plan piece was less about, you know, how frequently are you in communication with the city? I know you're in very regular communication with the city, but more about, uh, the responsibility of this body is to do a very specific thing here, which is to approve um, what you've presented to us. And, it, you know, in order to be able to do that really well and make sure that we're thorough in, in fulfilling our obligation here, it's, uh, I think it's important for, for you to, you know, meet with us directly and talk to us about, you know, what you're going to bring and what that's informed by um, prior to, to coming before us at committee. But Thank you for thank you. putting that on the public record. Member, thank you. Appreciate that suggestion. Of course, we have extensive conversations with your colleagues who represent downtown, but I certainly hear your point and appreciate it very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Thank you. That's Council all I've got. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, any other comments or questions from colleagues on this item? Not seeing it, so I'll just say how uh, much, and Council Member Vita said it so well, so I can't uh, <laughs> exceed it. Exceed that, but uh, just the thanks and gratitude. I know there's so many people that visit downtown, and just the, from the ambassadors to livability teams to you know the cleanliness to the greening to just uh, the welcomingness that's uh, behind the DID. It's uh, it's so 
refreshing. And I think for folks that haven't been to downtown in a while or don't necessarily remember it, it's surprising and a really uh, positive thing that leaves a positive impact. And it's something that's really needed, especially at this time where there are perceptions of downtown that don't match the reality. And so you continue to do that on the ground work, really changing hearts and minds and uh, leaving our city better for it. And so really appreciate all the work that you do. And so glad you're able to join us here. Uh, I was joking about the room being so packed in the crowd, but because uh, usually these meetings, we don't have a lot of people uh, at them, frankly. Uh, and funny little tidbit, most people don't sit on this side because then they get caught in the camera view, and so their reactions get captured and stuff. Uh, so fun little city hall history for you, but uh, our council chamber history. But, you know, it is really good to see all of you out here today supporting this. I think it just speaks to how many people are involved. And, and it's also something I'm mindful of is that while there's so many of you here, that really means there's a lot more that aren't here today that are also behind this work as well. And I think uh, Mr. Kramer was talking about 120 uh, or so blocks. And I mean, that's a huge number. And, uh, you know, one block may contain 50 stories, right? And so it may really represent uh, thousands of people just coming to work and to live and to play uh, and all of that just on a single block alone. And you have uh, at least 120 of them. So it is a really impressive effort. We're really thankful for all of your work. And not seeing any other comments or questions, I will go ahead and move this item for approval. And all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, say nay. The motion carries. Thank you all very much. And we will go ahead and move on to our third public hearing of the day, which is considering the 2023 proposed services and service charges for seven special service districts, 428A districts. So I will go ahead and ask our director who will present on this item. Mr. Chair and committee members, uh, Mr. Carlson is back with us for this item. Uh, again, he's in the transportation maintenance and repair area, and he is the project manager of all of these other special service districts. Uh, well, hello again, uh, chair and council members. I was kind of hoping folks would stick around. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, a special service district allows property owners in a commercial area to collectively impose service charges on themselves each year to create a pool of funds. These funds are directed back in the form of enhanced services and special amenities. The enhanced services and special amenities are over and above what the city ordinarily provides. Each special service district is guided by an advisory board that is composed of property owners or their representative within a district. Each advisory board recommends the services, service frequencies, estimated budget, and the service charge methodology for their district. So for today, we have the 50th in France, 54th in Lindale, Bloomington Lake, Chicago Lake, East Lake, Lindale Lake, and the West Broadway Improvement Special Service Districts, all seeking approval for their 2023 proposed services and service charges. These, di these districts are referred to as 428A districts. The 428A refers to Minnesota statute which grants municipalities the authority to establish special service districts by local ordinance. All special service dis districts before you today were established under that statute. Just a note, uh, at, an upcoming, uh, at your upcoming October 13th uh, Public Works and Infrastructure Committee meeting, I'll be before you again to, prevent, uh, to present the 2023 budget requests for our legacy districts. Uh, these districts predate uh, the 428A statute. So more to come. Uh, over the summer, Public Works staff worked with each district's advisory board to recommend the services, prepare a budget, and review their assessment methodology for the coming year. These service charges would be collected on their 23, 2023 uh, real estate taxes in the same manner as special assessments. Each affected property owner was mailed a notice of public hearing and the service charge amount 10 days in advance of this public hearing. Also, was included, also, what was included in the mailing was a copy of the uh, proposed operating plan and budget. Staff, therefore, recommends passage of the resolution approving the 2023 operating plan, special services, cost estimates, 
service charges and the list of service charges for the coming year for the 50th in France, 54th in Lindale, Bloomington Lake, Chicago Lake, East Lake, Lindale Lake, and the West Broadway uh, Improvement Special Service Districts and authorizing the, Depu the Department of Public Works to proceed with the work. Lastly, I'd like to note that the combined budget cost estimate for these districts amounts to $787,000 in private investments within the Minneapolis public right-of-way. That concludes my presentation, and I am more than happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Carlson, uh, for that presentation, and I'm going to proceed to open the public hearing. I'll ask the clerk if anyone signed up to speak on this, not seeing any. <clears throat> if you did not sign up yet, and wish to speak specifically to this item of the special service districts, uh, please see the clerk to do so and feel free to come on up. If you are here for that, for these special service districts, yes, I see someone raising their hand. Please come on over. And as we welcome you here, I would say afterwards, if you could please connect up with our clerk to make sure that we got uh, your name recorded. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Um, uh, the reason I'm here today is to really represent, first of all, uh, my staff. Um, I have three properties on Lake and Lindale. Um, our business is called Bloody Gorgeous. It used to be called John English Salons. Uh, I've been here since 78 when I came to help horse start a Vader. And we were very successful in that. And uh, that, that it was, we sold it. Anyway, uh, on Lynn Lake, I got these three properties, one of which I bought from Rembrandt Castle, which included two properties together, but I chose not to conjoin them uh, because they were presented to me as separate but as a joint sale. The other one was what now is known as Muddy Waters. Um, uh, this, 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 this program here of extra taxes or payments towards things that are hardly luxurious. I mean, we need trash bins, otherwise the street is filthy dirty. Uh, snow removal, uh, I, I would have thought that's a public service, but we pay extra. And, and to be honest, I haven't, I haven't minded in the past uh, because I was well, I'm 71, I was well uh, and ap appreciated the interest in improving Lynn Lake. Uh, I used to be on uh, Lake and Hennepin, which I'm very lucky I've gotten out of. It's got weird stuff going on now. I still can't believe it when I go through that. And I live there and have two houses on that side, one for my in-laws, because they're 90, and uh, one for my wife and myself, except I now have to live at my studio because I can't go upstairs. Uh, these extra services were fine before COVID took us and Muddy Waters out of business. Um, they left there owing me over $200,000 uh, and gave me the equipment as, as, instead of the money, which has proved not to be very useful. Uh, it's been two years uh, since they left. Um, and I've been carrying the property taxes, which were assessed uh, based on their success. Uh, people looked at how much money they were making. Um, they were making a fortune. I wish, I, I wish I'd been them and not the property owner. Um, since when I have paid off all those properties, actually every property I have uh, at 71, uh, I've paid off as an investment and as a support system as an elder, let alone a very sick elder. Unfortunately, it's been the reverse. Like I'm supporting it into just Lindale. Um, I'm putting in um, uh, every three months, every quarter, uh, I'm putting in 50000 to $70,000 every three months to sustain my business and keep my people employed at um, Muddy Waters uh, to, to be there. Uh, real estate agents are trying to lease it 
and at this point now sell it because with things like this I cannot afford to keep it anymore. I mean, uh, I was here last week uh, before I went for my stint at Mayo and uh, uh, over producing uh, water <laughs> for, for my premises and um, uh, whether the bills have been paid or not, which they have not uh, been paid, I own $9,000. Um, and uh, actually $12,000 there, and $9,000 for utility work. Something went wrong in the street. Uh, they sent me information on it. I didn't sign it because I didn't have the money to have that improvement. And th they talked to my wife and then went ahead and did it. Uh, I know you're not the utility department, but I'm trying to present a picture of these things come up and we kind of assess it. Okay, uh, we, we uh, you throw me off now, dear. <laughs> uh, where was I? Uh, yeah, these things come up uh, for businesses, but to do like an equal amount and not take into consideration, for instance, like the, the assessments on the Muddy Waters establishment was how much money they were making. Uh, but when you get in this sort of situation and then these things are just averaged out per location, out of unexpectancy, it seems unfair on small business owners that have taken on a lot, not for themselves, but for the community. I mean, I've already kept up those three premises, uh, but being charged three times, being one business owner, on losing entities, uh, property values are dropping, not, not increasing, uh, let alone any money that I have, which is only a, uh, my parents leaving me uh, uh, an inheritance, which was in England, and I had to transfer it over here to be able to keep my staff employed. The beauty industry got terribly hurt, more than the restaurant industry. Once, because we're a hand-on business, so people were afraid to come to us. And some of us being a wee bit eccentric. <laughs> Scares people a bit too. It, uh, it, it's the facts of this stuff coming up, and it's been there before, and I've paid it. Uh, I don't know why it's special interest. I don't see that at all. And uh, I didn't ask for these things. I'm quite happy decorating my own tree. And um, some people can't keep their storefronts up, let alone pay extra for trees, and yet they're forced to spend money on trees, which economically doesn't make, a, doesn't make sense. Uh, I know it looks pretty all the way down the road, but then as we pay for it and say, leave it up for the whole year, it makes the neighbourhood look friendly. But then we have to pay for someone to take them down, which doesn't make sense because it makes us look pretty. I get it. But it's a matter of affordability, pretty or not, and I'm in the pretty business. you know. But even as individuals, we have to draw the line somewhere. I mean, I know you're not going to make your, your treatments for your hair, number one, but you may still get the basic haircut. I feel the same way as paying the city. I don't mind paying extra for things that are really off the top extra. You know, we want more than other people in the city. I don't believe what we get on this assessment is anything extra, really. You know, I, I think that we deserve this as part of the substantial taxes, especially me, that, that I pay every year. And then when I, if I'm sick or the businesses are down now, and, you know, I'm paying property taxes, I think, the second quarter, $43,000 in taxes. I mean, I'm unemployed, spending my time in hospitals, which isn't free, uh, still trying to maintain enough to even come here and, and make this point of view, not speaking for myself, but just generally as business owners that may come across uh, health issues that, you know, that no one budgeted for, and yet still showing up at work every day, doing the best we can with what we've got, and then receiving these special assessments without any, you know, any, any effort from the city to make exceptions to the rule by extending these payments until maybe it's leased. Uh, I've managed to uh, do that with one of my homes, this waterwork thing in the street, which I still don't understand. 
because they need that equipment to deliver the water to me that I pay for. But, you know, uh, I'm paying there. But here on Lindell, three premises uh, and being charged equally on all three and equally as everybody else, every other business owner along there does, does not seem fair and is putting me out of business. So then people will end up with three buildings not functioning. You know, my staff went from 29 hairdressers down to four and my wife. Mm. She's coming behind a chair at 63 years old. I just physically can't do it or I'd be doing it to keep my four people uh, that are still employed because, again, they're all sent their freebies from the government, but they sent them to their homes rather than to me to be able to pay salaries. So they don't feel committed to me anymore and most of them have stayed home getting payments still and saw that there was a freebie ride from the government uh, as an unemployed person rather than come back to work. If I'd been paying their salary, they would have humanly felt more committed because they're not bad people. They're just responding to the benefits that they got, you know. But anyway, I'm not going to stand here whining. I'm just trying to represent small business owners that have invested in the properties because they could do more to them and make them look nice, uh, of which I've made a really big effort on. If you see my... If it's called Bloody Gorgeous, it can't be bloody ugly, can it? You know? <laughs> it looks ridiculous. Uh, you know, and, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a large facility on, uh, from, from the street. I mean, three, four... It's 120 feet of streetscape. But this much money for what I'm getting, I should be able to have it. If I don't have a choice to have it or not, I shouldn't be charged extra. Not even based on the majority, even more so not on the majority. I'm not a majority business, small business owner. I'm not the majority. You know, I'm still lucky to be here, uh, thanks to Mayo, uh, as we all know. Uh, uh, and I'm grateful uh, for uh, most of the things the city provides. Uh, uh, to, to the police department, so I just had my front window smashed. Uh, it's, it's pathetic that people should be able to, afraid to come to an area, which is more than our area, but it's pretty bad in our area, I've got to say. But what? I don't whine about it. Front of my business has a small parking lot. I'm going to produce valet parking attendants, let my clients know that they're there, they're armed taser wise, they're safe to pull in there, they can then drive around the back and we'll charge their cars if they're electric again, to promote the area as a facility that produces uh, the things that people want when they want to shop. I don't know what can be done about it, well, other than being here, painfully, and just stating my situation. Yeah. Uh, what else can you do? So, uh, so uh, thank you so much for sharing your testimony on this. If, if you don't have any other questions or comments on this, I do. Once we close the public hearing, I want to address some of the things you said and be able to see if we can How get you we, connected you up. How so, what, what does that mean? Well, well, we need to, so we're in the public hearing right now. So yeah. if, you're, if you're wrapped up with comments, then what we'll do is we'll see if anyone else uh, has any comments right. and then we'll close the public hearing and then I'll refer back to some of your comments. Okay, this is procedurally that. how I, we, how we, how how we do that. this. So I'm, I'm sorry yeah. if, if it was a bit long. Oh, no, no worries. It's, uh, this but, yeah, is it's what we're going to do. Is about it, so. Absolutely. Understandable. Okay. I appreciate thank it. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Is there anyone else here to speak on this item? Anyone else? Anyone else? Okay. I'm going to go ahead and close the public hearing. And then Thanks. specifically, I wanted to mention, maybe we could have you connect up with staff because it sounds like there's a number of uh, different issues there. Everything from, uh, I think it would be helpful to connect up with somebody in the assessor's office, as you mentioned, around the Money Waters business. There's some questions here around even things about how decisions are made with the special service district, such as leaving the lighting up or not. There's questions around, is there deferment available uh, as you're waiting to get leased up, which is a very creative idea that I think uh, deserves some merit, and I'm sure staff have some answers to. Uh, and then even this question of you have three buildings and how do you assess when you have multiple conjoined buildings as well and what does that look like? So I think there's at least four questions I picked up from there that I think we could dig into more from a staffing standpoint. So Mr. Carlson, if you're willing to 
have some conversation as well and make a connection here. Uh, and this isn't something that needs to be addressed right now. I think this is more uh, connecting up uh, with our constituent here. And if you're able to uh, help answer his questions offline and then any additional uh, questions uh, that we need to get involved in the committee, we're happy to. Absolutely. So we can exchange contact information. Perfect. Thank you so much. And director, Thank comment you. or question? Thank yes. you, Mr. Chair. I just want to add that Mr. Dodds will join that meeting um, uh, in terms of the water issues as well to try to hear what has happened here. Perfect. I really appreciate that, Director. I appreciate you coming down as well, sir, to be able to uh, voice these concerns. And we, we appreciate your presence on uh, Lindale. And I've uh, been by the business many times, not my particular place where I get my hair cut, but I appreciate it. So uh, uh, that's more a factor of my geography and where I, I live, not in the Lynn Lake area. But... <laughs> <laughs> But yes, thank you. So I'm going to see if any of my colleagues have any comments or questions on that. Uh, if not, I will go ahead and move uh, that we uh, move this item on to full council. So uh, not seeing any other comments or questions, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, say nay. That motion carries. Uh, with that, we've concluded all business before this committee. So without any objections, we stand adjourned. Thank you, everyone.